Thank you very much to the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center for having us, and it's a great honor for me to be here with uh, David Jernigan. He is, as you all know, an international guru on the alcohol issue, and we're just so lucky to have him here in Maryland. Uh, and as you'll see in my presentation, he played a key role in, in our success. As, as Molly said, I've had the great privilege and honor over the years of working on public health issues with people in this building and in Hampton House many, many times on reducing gun violence and teen smoking, underage drinking, and expanding health care. And one of the things I learned in working on these issues is that the vast majority of the public strongly supports the public health measures like raising the alcohol tax that, that uh, David talked about, but not everybody. And we all know the people who are part of that small but loud min uh, minority that oppose what we're doing that consider us the public health Nazis that call David and me names like that. And I'll never forget when I was making a presentation in my own neighborhood in Northeast Baltimore to get their support for reducing gun violence. They supported it. It was great. A couple years later, I went to the get their support for increasing tobacco tax. And this really big guy in front of the audience got up and said, aren't you the guy who came after my guns? Now you're trying to take away my cigarettes. Next thing I know, you're coming after my ham. And I assured him we're going to leave his ham alone. Uh, but they uh, supported what we were doing, and we, we, made, we made some progress. The, my point is that there are the loud but vocal major, uh, small uh, minority of people who oppose what we're doing, but they aren't the reason we don't make successes in these areas. The reason are powerful vested interests who have a lot of money and who pour a lot of money into opposing the public health measures we propose because they make money off the status quo, off the sales of alcohol, the sales of cigarettes and guns. And they have managed in Maryland up until this year to block increase in the alcohol tax for 40 years. And we have one of the lowest alcohol taxes in the country. Similarly, they stopped for years increasing in the cigarette tax and progress on reducing gun violence. But a group of us in Maryland put together what we're, we call a six-step process to overcome this, uh, this opposition. And it's worked. It's worked this year on increasing the alcohol tax, and it's worked on tobacco taxes and reducing gun violence, and it's a process that is discussed in his book that Molly mentioned by Michael Perchek, of, of um, former FTC chair, called DeMarco Factor, Transforming Public Will into Political Power. And if you're interested in more about this process, I urge you to take a look at this book by Michael, Michael Perchek. So what I'm going to do today is talk about this process, how we applied it and successfully to the situation here uh, in Maryland on the alcohol tax. But I want you to think about this as broader. This is a, pol a process that works when you have a situation, a public health measure that works, you have strong popular support, and you have a powerful vested interest opponent. In each of the campaigns I've worked on with this, with this process, it looked like before we started that it was impossible. We were told to get lost. You could never raise the alcohol tax in Maryland, never raise tobacco tax, never reduce gun violence. But we did. And the six steps that, are, that you see on here are, one, come up with a smart public health policy. Two, do some serious public interest polling on the issue. Three, build a powerful coalition. Four, use the media to the hilt. Five, make it an election issue. And six, take it to the legislature and get it passed. So we'll talk, we'll talk about each of these steps and how important they are. Um, step one is coming up with a, a, a plan to de deal with the problem. The problem we're talking about here is underage drinking, lack of money for health care. How do we do that? And we're lucky in Maryland to have the Hopkins School of Public Health and people like David Jernigan that we could go to them and say, how do we address this problem? And David said, raise the alcohol tax. And that is a smart plan that we knew right away because of evidence that David taught us from other states works. One of the things we had to do, though, was get that message out to the public, not just a broader public, but also the advocates. One of the things that astounded me for years is that the leading legislatures who were pushing an alcohol tax and even some of the leading advocates had no idea that increasing the alcohol tax reduced underage drinking and save lives. They didn't think it could do that. They just wanted the money for these uh, public health uh, purposes, which was great. But until they knew that the alcohol tax had this other benefit, they were hamstrung in their ability, I think, to get it passed. So we went to David and we asked him to do a study in Maryland. Now, there were national studies and they were fine, but the people of Maryland, the legislators and the policymakers and the advocates of Maryland wanted to know, how does it benefit us? That's why David did a Maryland-specific study of how many lives were saved by increasing the alcohol tax. And this had a dramatic impact. 
Our legislators now knew this, now could talk about this with, with their colleagues. And I'll tell you about one critical meeting we had with a key leader in Maryland, the Speaker of the House. Speaker of the House had been a strong opponent of alcohol taxes for years. He supported our tobacco tax increase, but he always said to me, alcohol taxes hurt people. I don't want to work on those. I, I don't want to propose those, support those. But David showed him that study. He read the study, he had a meeting with David, and he became convinced. And ultimately became one of our strongest supporters. So these studies can have a, a really, really major impact. David talked to you about what the studies say and how, how important it is. Um, it's very important to do step one right and to have a smart evidence-based plan to deal with the problem. Now, I've done the same thing on tobacco and on health care. Professor Brad Herring is in the audience here as part of a group from this building who put together a health care plan for us. So come up with a smart plan to deal with the problem you want to address. Okay, that's step one. Step two. You want to know where the public stands. On each of these campaigns, we started with a situation where the policymakers were saying, get lost, never going to happen. But what did the people of Maryland think? So we did some uh, polling. Now, clearly, there is strong support for alcohol tax increases, and David shows us that from around the country. But we wanted to know more. How strongly do people support um, uh, an alcohol tax increase? So we, we asked a series of three questions, and this is where we got really important data. In the next election, for whom are you going to vote, a Democrat or a Republican? Just a straight-up generic test. And the Maryland's a blue state, so Democrat was up by about 16 points, as you see here. But then we asked, what if the Democrat supports increasing the alcohol tax and a Republican opposes it? Well, you see, suddenly the, the Democrat's up by 24 points, a significant switch to the Democrat. But then we asked question number three, what if the Republican supports the alcohol tax, and the Democrat opposes it, well, suddenly the Democrat's down by 10 points. Now, this is significant. This kind of polling is what the policymakers, the legislators who are up for election really want to know. They want to know that the voters care about this issue enough to make it a, a voting issue. So that was critical number two, is get that polling, uh, polling data and get the word out about it. Step three. Now, this is very important coalition building, coalition building and building the grassroots support. I talk to people all around the country, and I see and I hear and I talk to them about the fact that advocates make the big mistake of going from step one and maybe step two all the way to step six to the legislators. They skip this critical process of building the broad-based coalition. We know from our polling that the strong majority of Marylanders supported the alcohol tax increase. They would make it a voting issue, but we need to mobilize them. We need to get them engaged, and that takes a while. It takes time, and we always spend at least a couple of years ignoring the policymakers, ignoring the legislators, and instead talking with the people uh, of, our, of our state. Key is the faith community. You want to reach out to different kinds of groups and bring a broad-based coalition, but I always found it's important on a public health campaign where you're trying to beat a vested interest opposition is to reach out to the faith community for four key reasons. They have strong moral authority. They have the authority that legislators have to pay attention to. Second, that's where the grassroots is. That's where the people are who can make the calls, write the letters. You know, when you're battling the alcohol industry, there are these little uh, uh, alcohol shops on corners where people come in and write these notes to their legislators. The best way to overcome that is by having churches, synagogues, mosques, faith places where people can go in and be mobilized and write their letters and contact their legislators. That's where the grassroots is. Third, media. The media loves the faith community taking on big tobacco, the alcohol industry. It's like a David versus Goliath battle that's guaranteed to get you top media coverage. And it happened with us on all the issues I've worked on. When I worked on a tobacco campaign, we had our faith leaders together, and the head of the United Methodist Church said that he wanted to kick the butts of the tobacco companies. He was livid when that wasn't in the paper, but what was in the paper was the head of the Lutheran Church saying that for years, the Methodists had gotten all excited about tobacco, and we Lutherans had made fun of them. I'm here to say the Methodists were wrong, right, and the Lutherans were wrong, and we're going to work with the Methodists. And that was in the paper, and that was front page of the Baltimore Sun. And similarly, on alcohol, we got tremendous media attention when the faith community took on uh, the alcohol industry. And fifth, uh, fourth, I mean diversity. You build tremendous diversity for your campaign when you reach out to the faith community. Racial, economic, social, and political Cross the boundaries, people come together and through through the faith community and, and your effort. 
It's important to recruit key leaders within them. It's important to reach out to many groups. And it's very important to have a, a document. Let me start with this. You have a one-page document to take to organizations, a resolution. And I think that's very, very important. A lot of advocates don't do this. They'll go in and talk to an organization, tell them why they should support us, and then leave without having something in their hand. Have a document that they can put through their process and endorse and be part of your, of your effort. And then you make a list of all the supporters. And we have hundreds of organizations, thousands sometimes, that are part of our, our, of our coalition. And um, that has a big impact on policymakers when they see these powerful organizations supporting, um, supporting this effort from one end of the state uh, to the other. In the process, you go around and you get make sure you get a lot of groups within the districts of the key policymakers, the chairs of the key committees, president and uh, Senate House Speaker. You get them. You get. You make sure there are people in their districts also. This process takes time. And one important thing about this process that I want to emphasize is it is not lobbying. A lot of my colleagues from around the country get scared when they don't they can't do lobbying or their lobbying is limited and they're afraid to take a resolution like this and take it to some organizations to sign. But when I take an organization calling for alcohol tax increase to the United Methodist Church, to the NAACP, that is not lobbying. I even went to the State Ethics Commission in Maryland to get an official letter from them saying it's not lobbying. Why is that important? Because most of us get most of our money in nonprofit world from foundations, from individuals who take tax deduction. That's very limited in how much we can do for lobbying. So to the extent that you can use this money for non-lobbying activities, it really helps you. And building this coalition is something you could do in, without, lobbying, uh, without lobbying money. And also, you want to have key partners, key partners who will take a lead in making things happen on, on the issue. Not all, not all the hundreds of people will come to meetings and really play a central role, but you need to have a key coalition, which, which we did. And as, as David said, a lot of them are groups that are working on the funding we want to use this money for, for development disabilities, mental health, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, et cetera. So build, build your coalition and spend a lot of time on that. Have some simple information for people, but it's very important that you keep it simple and that you have just a one-page document that you want them, uh, you want them to endorse. Um, step four, media. Anybody who works with me knows that I love to call, I love to email, I can be a real nudge, but I can't call five million Marylanders, right? And I consider the media a giant telephone. It's the way to reach out to the millions of people that we can't call and nudge directly. But you have to do this right. You have to focus on the media as a key part of your camp of your campaign and as you know there are two kinds of media earned and paid earned media is when you get a newspaper article when you um, get a TV story when you get an editorial about about your campaign and um, that's very important to maximize that and you maximize that in two ways one build a relationship with the reporters Make sure you talk with them, make sure you answer their questions, and make sure you, you, you respect them. And second, make sure you do a good job of putting together events and ways to get uh, media coverage. I mentioned the tobacco tax uh, uh, with the faith community. If we had done a, a press conference with faith leaders say tobacco is bad, that would have been a big yawn, right? But a press conference with faith leaders calling for a tobacco tax increase, that was front page of the paper. That night on TV, the icon said, God versus tobacco. You can't, can't really beat that. Also, when we announced our study that David did, we got a lot of media attention for that because of two things. One, it was a good study showing that lives were saved in Maryland by increasing the alcohol tax. That's news. And second, we had good messengers like David Jernigan, who knows how to talk, talk to the media. It's very important that the people you put out there are people who, who really know how to talk to the media. Now, one way of do dealing with the media that colleagues of mine and I disagree with is a lot of my colleagues will um, script their speakers to the word. I don't do that. I prefer to find faith leaders and others who can speak from the heart, and I think that works better. Sometimes it doesn't work, but usually it works a, a lot better. Similarly, on the polling data, again, if we tried to release a poll that said the majority of Marylanders support an alcohol tax, that's a big yawn. 
but a poll showing that voters would switch their allegiance to support candidates who supported an alcohol tax or a tobacco tax. That's news, and that got uh, substantial, substantial coverage. Paid media. A lot of us um, in the nonprofit community don't have enough money for a lot of TV, a lot of uh, big print ads, but one of the ways that I think is very effective is, um, is, is radio. Radio is something that can get the message out, and it works, and it also gets a lot of earned media in addition if it's a good radio ad. I'm going to play a couple of them for you, some on tobacco and some on alcohol, but the first one I'm going to play is one which tried to deal with questions that were raised about the issue. So we had people saying, will alcohol ta- will tobacco taxes really reduce teen smoking? Uh, won't this hurt poor people? So we've got a great messenger, Bishop Doug Miles, and I hope I can do this, who, um, who, who p- did a radio ad for us that I'm going to play, and then we'll talk about it for a second. All right. Let me see. if. Excuse me a second. Here it is, sorry. Here it goes. This is the Reverend Douglas Miles. For years, tobacco companies have been targeting our teens, working to addict our children to their deadly drug. Big Tobacco has put billboards all over our neighborhoods, given away free samples to get our children hooked, and kept their prices low to keep us addicted to cigarettes. Working together, we stood up to Big Tobacco and won the fight to get their billboards out of our neighborhoods. But we must do more. Raising cigarette prices will cut teen smoking and is one of the best things we can do to protect our health. Now Big Tobacco is trying to convince us that higher cigarette prices would hurt poor people. Don't be fooled. The only people higher cigarette prices will hurt are the tobacco companies trying to addict our families. God has given us all the gift of life, and we must do our part by keeping our children safe and well. For more information, call MedKai at 410-539-0872. Paid for by MedKai, the Maryland State Medical Society, and by Smoke Free Maryland. As you can see, that ad doesn't talk about legislation. This is a a similar ad doing the same thing. All right. So as you saw from that one ad and part of the other one, what we were trying to do was get the message out that increasing cigarette taxes reduce teen smoking in a way that really can move, get the public to understand the importance of, um, of doing this. Because our polling showed, and this is true on tobacco and alcohol, that although people support an alcohol tax or tobacco tax, not all of them were convinced that it would actually reduce teen smoking and underage drinking. So the more you can get that message out to people, the better, the better for the cause. So, um, so we, we, we did those ads. Oh, man. So, um, sorry, sorry about this, folks. So the, the, the paid media is very important, and we always got lots of media coverage about the radio ads, which was also very important. Um, here are just some examples of some of the headlines about the alcohol tax. Supporters continue to push for an alcohol tax, cheap drunk state from one, one end of the state to the other. And we also work to get editorial support. It's very important to get support from the big papers and the little papers. And we went to the editorial boards early on to convince them that increasing the alcohol tax would reduce teen smoking and underage drinking and alcohol abuse and provide money for key purposes. So that helped to get our, build our support around the country. That's step four. Step five, elections. Now this is hard for a lot of nonprofits because they're used to 
educating the public, and so a lot of them do some lobbying, but not many of them make it make their issue an election issue. And when you're facing a powerful opponent like we like we were, you need to make your issue an election issue, I believe, to overcome that vested interest um, vested interest op opposition. So the first thing we did during the campaign season was to take that resolution that all those hundreds of organizations had signed and send it to every candidate. We sent it for, to every candidate who was running for the governor and general assembly and urged them to endorse it. Now, usually candidates don't like to sign these kind of documents. They like to just run on their good looks or their party name or their, or their whatever they want to run on, but they don't like to take positions. So our job was to force them to do so because unless we did that, we weren't going to get our alcohol tax, uh, alcohol tax passed. So at this time during the election season is when our coalition really got revved up and was contacting the candidates and demanding that they sign these documents. When you're a community leader or a local faith leader or even an, an NAACP leader and you're going to talk to somebody during a legislative session, to them, a legislator, you're just another pain in the neck trying to get on their nerves, right? Trying to get them to do something they don't want. During election time, you're something very different, right? You're somebody whose support they want. Maybe they're coming to your group for an endorsement. Maybe they want money from you. And if what they hear from you is, have you, have you signed that resolution yet for the alcohol tax, it rings differently. They need to hear from you. And that was suddenly having a tremendous impact. I'll tell you one story about the alcohol tax, which rang true about how powerful this was. There was a legislative district south of here represented at last year by Senator George Della, who had been in office for 40 years and hated my guts because he had to vote for toba tobacco taxes and gun laws he didn't like. And we were sure he wasn't going to sign this uh, alcohol tax resolution. He, we got it to him. We got it to his opponent. His opponent signed right away. The opponent ultimately beat him. And then a few days later, we got one signed by George Della, and we were just shocked. Why would he sign that? And we, he signed it because his, he was just hearing from his, one end of the community to the other that they wanted this done. And then I heard that in the inner circle of his office, he was saying to people, well, you know, uh, Fer Ferguson's going to use this against me. I hate that, DeMarco, but I better sign this thing. And he signed it. And that was happening all across the state that legislators who would never think of voting for an alcohol tax, thought the alcohol companies were too powerful, didn't want to vote for it, were signing these resolutions. And why was it? Because we had done steps one, two, and three, and four effectively to get the message out. And here we were filling their mailboxes with calls and letters from uh, constituents who were saying, sign that, uh, sign that resolution. Uh, we, we put a cutoff date of August 27th, by which time they had to sign, and the results were tremendous. By the time of our cutoff date, 147 candidates from all across the state of Maryland had signed this document. And this was historic, and this is when we knew that we were going to get uh, an alcohol tax because we had almost a majority of both houses who were going to win uh, sign on. And then you can see after the ultimate uh, election, uh, 75 actual winners who were going to be in a general assembly had signed our, our resolution. And again, these were primarily people who would never think of voting for an, an alcohol tax uh, before this. Um, the interesting thing here is that during this time we were doing this, there was virtually no opposition from the alcohol lobby. And, you know, David has talked to you about how powerful they are. I told you that they blocked... Um, alcohol tax increases for 40 years in Maryland. So you may ask, where were they? Why weren't they battling you? Well, it's because they, tobacco lobbies, the gun lobby, they do great in the halls of Annapolis where nobody's looking. But out in the public, they're not going to counter us with a press conference and saying alcohol is good for kids. You know, they're not going to do that. They're, they're, they were just had no response to what we did. We had the field basically uh, to ourselves. And this was the same when I did the tobacco tax campaign and on the gun campaign. During this part of the process, all these powerful vested interests had really uh, nothing to say. Uh, and um, I think that's very important for you all to understand that this is a way to reach the public, mobilize people, affect these legislators in a way that these powerful vested interests really don't have a good way to respond. 
And then step six, once you've done steps one, two, three, uh, four, and five, is to get into the legislature and get the job done. And now we are ready to do this. The campaign I just talked about, we started in about 2008, went through 2008, 2009, did all the steps one, two, three, four. In, in 2010, did step five. We made an election issue. 2011, we were ready for step six. And now we were ready to hold a smart hearing. David Jernigan did a great job of answering questions from legislators on cross-border issues, all the rest. You still have to do a lot of work, even though we've done steps one, two, three, four, and five. But the difference was they were listening. Because of what we had done up till now, they knew they had to listen to us. Their people were watching. Many of them had signed that resolution. And it's very hard to go back when you do that. I remember when I was working on a tobacco tax campaign, one state senator who had signed our resolution on a tobacco tax tried to back out during the legislative session. Well, her local paper published her resolution on the front page, and she did the right thing because they know people are watching. In all these years that I've worked on this issue, since 1994, on guns, tobacco, health care, and alcohol, only one delegate and one senator actually voted against what they pledged to do. The vast majority of them know that they got to stick with that, and it's a tremendous base on which to build. And the leadership of the legislature, who didn't want to pass any tax, and remember in 2011, no other tax passed besides the alcohol tax, even though other taxes were proposed and legislators didn't want to pass any tax. But because of our campaign, they felt the need to pass, um, to pass the alcohol tax. So we did all the basic stuff you do, and even then it was, it was going to be tough to pass the tax we wanted to raise, the, raise the dime a drink excise tax in, uh, in Maryland. And then something happened out of the blue, which I'll end with, and then we can go to questions and answers, we had out of the blue, um, we found out that District of Columbia, which has the same excise tax in Maryland and was one of the biggest arguments of the alcohol lobbies that we couldn't raise our excise tax above DCs, had a few years ago increased a sales tax on alcohol. And that was something nobody knew about. In fact, I called David and David didn't know about it. The alcohol lobby people didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. And suddenly, that was a way the legislators could increase the alcohol tax without going higher than D.C., because D.C. already had that higher sales tax. It was interesting to me that for years, the alcohol lobby people had testified before a legislature that the D.C. tax is the same as the alcohol tax. I went to one of my friends who uh, works the alcohol lobby, and I said, all these years, were you lying or just stupid? And he pled stupidity. He said, we were all just stupid. But the point was that it was a great opening for us. But that opening wouldn't have mattered if we hadn't done steps one, two, three, four, and five. Because we'd done those steps, when that opening happened, we were ready to get our uh, legislation, uh, get our legislation enacted. And um, we, we did a great job with the, the coalition in general of having good hearings, having rallies, and everything else. And in the end, the alcohol tax that passed will raise about 80 to $100 million a year and substantially reduce underage drinking and alcohol uh, abuse, uh, abuse in Maryland. One footnote, though, that's very important. As David said, and I said earlier, we had in our original proposal tied the money to some specific public health causes like health care, drug and alcohol abuse, and, um, and development disabilities. In the end, in the legislature, in order to pass it at the very end, they put a lot of the money in the first year into school construction. And that caused a lot of angst for a lot of people in our coalition. And it caused some of our opponents to shed crocodile tears over the fact that the money wasn't going to mental health services directly as in our proposal. One, our main opponent named uh, Delegate Schmiegel. Anybody here a fan of Lord of the Rings? Isn't that a great name for an opponent? And he was saying on the floor of the House that we can't have this pass. It's just a front for the governor wanting some money. It's not going to these purposes. Well, the law passed. And what I want to emphasize to people is that we are working closely with the governor and General Assembly to make sure that after the first year, the money goes to these mental health, development disability, drug and alcohol abuse, and health care uh, problems. And we have a letter from the governor pledging to work with us, and we're close to making that happen. So this law is great for several reasons. One, it's going to reduce underage drinking and alcohol abuse. 
Two, we're going to get the money going to those public health uh, needs. And third, it's being talked about as a model across the country. David has talked about that a little. I was invited to Massachusetts to speak with a, a group there working on this issue, and I described this process to them. They're going to try to follow that. David had invited me to meet with advocates from across the country. I think this model for raising the alcohol tax is going to spread uh, all, all around the country. Thank you very much.